Hello there. Well, what did she just say? Tens of thousands of mostly young men, many with values and social mores at odds with our own, mm -hmm. pouring into our country day after day, month after month, year after year. Well, she's not holding back, is she? There's more like that to follow in a minute as well. And she supports pulling out of the ECHR too. The former Home Secretary Suella Braverman gave her personal post-sacking statement to the House of Commons this afternoon. You can watch the whole ten minutes in a moment. And she pushed all the buttons the vast majority of the UK electorate want to see pushed while throwing the gauntlet down at Rishi Sunak's feet. It is now or never, she said, warning that her party faces electoral oblivion. In the knowledge that rebel Tories have been gathering recently in darkened rooms to discuss the PM's failings. But far from totally eviscerating the Prime Minister and throwing teddies out of cots, as some had expected and hoped, she played more the state's person, giving the Prime Minister some advice on how to turn round the Tory party's sad-looking electoral chances by getting tough on stopping the boats. But I think she knows that Rishi Sunak will never get tough. And pundits are saying that the much-awaited but yet-to-be-unveiled emergency legislation is being watered down by the hour. And she knows that bitterly hounding the current Tory leader will not get her voted in as the next one, because it's not the British way. So for me, this is Suella Braverman setting the scene for her grown-up participation in a future Tory party leadership contest. But she must realise that whatever is done, if she did win, it would be a leadership facing many years of opposition in a difficult political wilderness, with the only hope that winning an early leadership contest might win her a couple of months as the final flailing Tory Prime Minister living in the last chance saloon of number 10. It was a strong speech and very focused, just the sort of thing that Tory supporters will want to hear, or, more accurately, what they wanted to hear years ago. But it's now a busted flush. Tory support is draining faster than my first pint of the evening. Now, before she gave the statement, the Deputy Speaker of the House, Eleanor Lang, was at great pains to point out that these personal statements are normally heard in silence and without interruption, which drew many a laugh and comment. MPs were obviously expecting handbags at dawn on this one. But they may have been disappointed. Anyway, here's her 10-minute speech in full. Personal statement, Suella Braverman. Yeah. Madam Deputy Seeker, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to make this statement and I'd like to put on record my wishes to, the, to Mr Speaker and that he makes a speedy recovery. Yeah. Yeah. Madam Deputy Speaker, serving in Cabinet for just under four years has been a true honour and I'm thankful for the opportunity and grateful to the many civil servants and ministers with whom I worked. We achieved a great deal in the last 12 months. Landmark legislation in the Public Order Act and the National Security Act. 20,000 new police officers, more than England and Wales have ever seen before. Yeah, yeah. One of the largest ever pay rises for the police. Greater powers to dismiss rogue officers and a review of the legal protections to empower our brave firearms officers. But, Madam Deputy Speaker, I want to talk about the crisis on which I spent more time working than any other. Mass, uncontrolled, illegal immigration. We are all here familiar with the problem. Tens of thousands of mostly young men, many with values and social mores at odds with our own, mm -hmm. pouring into our country day after day, 
month after month, year after year. Many come from safe countries. Many are not refugees, but are economic migrants. All have paid thousands of pounds to criminal gangs to break into Britain. All have come from a safe country, France, who, let's face it, should be doing so much more to stop them. This is putting unsustainable pressure on our public finances and our public services. It's straining community cohesion, jeopardising national security and harming public safety. The British people all understand this, Madam Deputy Speaker. The question is, does the government? And will it now finally act to stop it? The Prime Minister rightly committed to doing whatever it takes to stop the boats. And he should be commended for dedicating more time and toil than any of his predecessors to this endeavour. And unlike the Leader of the Opposition, who would rather bury his head in the sand, he has actually advanced a plan. We made some progress during my tenure as Home Secretary. The overall crossings have fallen by 30%. The number of illegal Albanian arrivals down by 90% and we were starting to close down asylum hotels. But, Madam Deputy Speaker, crossings are down is not the same as stopping the boats. And as Home Secretary, I consistently advocated for legislative measures that would have secured the delivery of our Rwanda partnership as soon as the bill became law. Last summer, following defeat in the Court of Appeal, I advised that we should scrap rather than continue passage of the Illegal Migration Act bill in favour of a more robust <coughs> alternative that excluded international and human rights laws. When that was rejected, I urged that we needed to work up a credible plan B in the event of a Supreme Court loss. Following defeat in the Supreme Court, the Prime Minister has finally agreed to introduce emergency legislation and I welcome his decision. But, Madam Deputy Speaker, it is now three weeks on from that judgment, and we are yet to see a bill. I'm told its publication is imminent, but we are running out of time. This is an emergency, and we need to see the bill now. Yeah. Madam Deputy Speaker, my deeper concern, however, relates to the substance of what may be in that bill. Previous attempts have failed because they did not address the root cause of the problem. Expansive human rights laws flowing from the European Convention on Human Rights, replicated in Labour's Human Rights Act, are being interpreted elastically by courts, domestic and foreign, to literally prevent our Rwanda plan from getting off the ground. And this problem relates to so much more than just illegal arrivals. From my time as Home Secretary, I can say that the same human rights framework is producing insanities that the public would scarcely believe. Foreign terrorists we can't deport because of their human rights. Terrorists we have to let back in because of their human rights. Foreign rapists and paedophiles who should have been removed but are released back into the community only to reoffend. Yep, because of their human rights. Violent criminals pulled off deportation flights at the last minute thanks to the help of Labour MPs, free to wander the streets and commit further horrific crimes, including murder. Protesters let off the hook for tearing down statues and gluing themselves to roads. And our brave military veterans harassed through the courts some 40 years after their service. Madam Deputy Speaker, it is no secret that I support leaving the European Convention on Human Rights yeah, yeah, yeah. and replacing the Human Rights Act with a British Bill of Rights that protects the vulnerable and our national security. Yeah. 
and finishes the job of Brexit by extricating us from the foreign court and restores real parliamentary supremacy. But I accept that the government won't do that and that it is a debate for another day. And crucially, when it comes to stopping the boats now, leaving the ECHR is not the only way to cut the Gordian knot. Emergency legislation would enable this only if it meets the following tests. Firstly, the bill must address the Supreme Court's concerns about the safety of Rwanda. Secondly, the bill must enable flights before the next election by blocking off all routes of challenge. The powers to detain and remove must be exercisable, notwithstanding the Human Rights Act, the European Convention on Human Rights, the Refugee Convention and all other international law. Thirdly, the bill must remedy deficiencies in the Illegal Migration Act to ensure that removals can take place within days rather than allowing individual claims and challenges which drag on for months. Fourth, the bill must enable the administrative detention of illegal arrivals until they are removed. And just as we rapidly built Nightingale hospitals to deal with COVID, so we must build Nightingale-style detention facilities to deliver the necessary capacity. Greece and Turkey have done so. Greece and Turkey have done so. And the only way to do this, as I advocated for in government, is with the support of the Ministry of Defence. Fifth, Parliament must be prepared to sit over Christmas to get this bill done. All of this, Madam Deputy Speaker, comes down to a simple question. Who governs Britain? Where does ultimate authority for the UK lie? Is it with the British people? and their elected representatives? Or is it in the vague, shifting and unaccountable concept of international law? On Monday, Madam Deputy Speaker, the Prime Minister announced measures that start to better reflect public frustration on legal migration. He can now follow that up with a bill that reflects public fury on illegal migration and actually stop the boats. Finally, Madam Deputy Speaker, it is now or never. The Conservative Party faces electoral oblivion in a matter of months if we introduce The Conservative Party faces electoral oblivion in a matter of months if we introduce yet another bill destined to fail. Do we fight for sovereignty or do we let our party die? Now, I may not have always found the right words in the past, Madam Deputy Speaker, but I refuse, I refuse to sit by and allow us to fail. The trust that millions of people placed in us cannot be discarded as an inconvenient detail. If we summon the political courage to do what is truly necessary, difficult though it may be, to fight for the British people, we will regain their trust. And if the Prime Minister leads that fight, he has my total support. Thank you. Well, there you have it. And if that's not a direct tilt at the title, then I don't know what is. What do you make of it? Now, the other event in town today was the appearance of the former Prime Minister Boris Johnson in front of the Health Emergency Inquiry. And much is being made of the bit where he seemed to break down in tears over some part of the government response. Over to you, Richard. So that idiot Boris Johnson, yes, Boris Johnson, the man whose government f***ed up more kids' lives than... King Charles' friends. Anyway, Boris Johnson is all enthusiastic about contributing to the, let's say, Global Health Emergency Governmental Response Inquiry. Well, that's because he won't get grilled in any meaningful way about the safety and efficacy of something, well, some, you know that thing, something that was practically mandated by his government, 
and may have caused far more harm than the than good. It may have hurt a lot of people, but you can't say that, can you? No. In fact, it could be behind the hushed up horrific number of excess people leaving us before their time. No, he won't get pulled up on that mandated thingy-me-jig. And he knows it. Otherwise, he would currently be living in some other part of the world, doing all he can to avoid, avoid and evade extradition back to the UK. But there may be a token grilling on him, but nothing serious. He's not going to come to, yeah, it's not going to come to anything, no. All I am seeing all, right now on Facebook is a constant stream of funeral notices for young men and women leaving us too soon. Why? Well, that question won't be asked in the inquiry. So Boris can and will continue to play the part of the more than helpful and willing participant. He will be asked about the government's response via the imprisoning of the population in their homes and the rights and wrongs therein, in terms of the timing, but little else will be brought up in relation to if home imprisonments were a good idea or not. There'll be a few things said, but they won't go into the nuts and bolts of it. No, because this was global. Everybody was doing it in lockstep. So th there was no real decision making, making made on, part, on the part of Boris Johnson. Why was Sweden an outlier, or was Sweden a token outlier in this matter? The whole thing, including the shutting down of the economy, will be put down to making the best decision based upon the evidence as it came in. Yes, following the science, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> and unfortunately, there are plenty of people who will nod their heads in agreement with that due to their very bad breeding. Yes, the people who have been nodding heads are the, the same sort of people who did the, you know, the, the old... <laughs> Do you remember that? <laughs> Boris Johnson's famous elbow thingy. No, Boris and the inquiry will not break the system by saying the system did something wrong, something catastrophically wrong in its outcome, where we don't actually know the full impact of the home imprisonments, the shutting down of the economy whilst handing out free money. And of course, we don't know the full impact of the arm-injected cough syrup. And let's not forget those that died in hospital because of what they were prescribed there. Don't tell me that didn't happen. Yes, it did happen. People were given certain medications when they, when they were in hospital for the uh, cough. I lost an uncle to this, to this treatment for the cough. And the family has no doubts over that one. We know who to blame on that. Oh, and let's not forget the rearranging of the wealth distribution, where the rich got richer and the poorer became poorer. You lot need to keep reframing the news, because Boris Johnson and the so-called so inquiry is nothing more than a whitewash for the state and establishment who hate you. There may be a slight war, you know, wrapping of the knuckles, but that's all you can expect from this. I mean, Boris might actually be a slight little bit of a, a scapegoat, but he won't face any real consequences. Anyway, what do you lot think about what has been said in today's video? Leave your gibberings and your jabberings in the comment section below for Jeff and I to read. And a huge thank you to all of you who support us via Patreon, PayPal and Super Thanks, because you help us you know, making these videos. And there's links in the descriptions box below on how to support us. And God bless you all, and bye for now.